everybody. Thank this you for joining us. This is still. Oh, what, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Oh, just thanks for joining us. Thank again. you for joining us. We're super excited. We just keep wanting to shine the light and love, and <laughs> we're so so excited to connect with you guys again. Thank you, thank you so much for thank coming you so to check much. us out. We really appreciate the support. We're learning our way, and we need your help. So please stay connected and let us know uh, how we could. Uh, do things that are exciting and for you guys. Yeah, topics you may yeah. may you if you please, think of something, jot please. it down, you know, and and make sure you put it in our inbox mm-hmm. or in the messages below, and we will try to address your topics as well. Absolutely, we are here to be of service. <laughs> and so this is still Danny McFarland, Woo! aka Danny Mac. Danny Mac, <laughs> uh, the little, uh, the little dance, the little. <laughs> Get down tonight. Uh, <laughs> and over here, we have the most beautiful Dr. See the Love. Hey, love, yes, baby. Love. love. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is part two of the Danny McFarlane um, interview, if Experiment. you will. He's been the Danny McFarlane <laughs> experience. You know, he's been sharing his um, yeah. his strength, his hope, you know. Um, with this, with us, with the audience. And so um, there were so many areas that we didn't get a chance to address. Um, Danny was generous enough to, you know, do this part two. So if you haven't seen part one, you can find it in the links below um, and you can get a chance at your leisure after this to get a chance to swing on back by in part one. Yeah, it's really it's a phenomenal journey. Yeah. Phenomenal Thank you. journey. Yes. Thank you. And so just to catch um <clears throat> the people up, do you want me to do over you what you shared or you want to do it? Uh, you know well, let's just I think we'd maybe just skip the over you because they're gonna watch it or listen to it and let's just maybe dive into what questions you might have from the last okay. the last episode. So, you know, we talked about your injury and yes. how um, you were no longer um, physically mm. able to serve in law enforcement. And, and you know, to just I really wanted to call us back to that because for you to have invested so much time and heart and energy into a profession and then all of a sudden find that that just was no longer – a possibility in the way that it showed up to just take us back to that time in your life. How many years ago was that now? 18 years ago, October 10th, 2001. Wow. was the uh, awakening date (laughs) for Danny Mac. Um, Yeah. So it was 18 years ago. This, this just a month ago or this month. Yeah. This month still for two more days. Yeah. Wow. So 18 years ago, take us back. Well, it wasn't immediately that you realized it wasn't going to be, you weren't going to be able to go back to the profession, but that's when the journey began. No, definitely. Uh, it was a it was a really interesting time for me because I had felt like I had went through so many struggles uh, growing up, uh, overcoming certain challenges. And uh, life, and 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 to staying positive, and and just <clears throat> not complaining. As I mentioned last episode, you know, having uh, really beliefs around not complaining mm-hmm. and not asking for help, like just really just showing up and 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 doing your best to overcome things, <clears throat> and believing that showing up in that way. Should give me a positive report, a positive result. If you're doing what you're supposed to do with right. the right attitude, right. then you should get the outcome that you want. Right, right, right. So it was an interesting thing to just really I had at that time in my life. I had finally got to a spot where I, I felt like I had made it in a sense. You know, I was in my career. I had. Um, smartly invested into buying real estate and had owned a few properties at the time. I had met a beautiful girlfriend that uh, I was in love with, and we had been dating probably three, three and a half years at the time I got into the accident. 
Um, the next steps were like, wow, I'm in my career. I did it. You know, I did it on my own. I didn't need anybody's <laughs> help, you know, like, yeah, at least that's the way I, I interpreted mm-hmm. it. And, uh, <clears throat> and I was like, wow, okay, I'm going to get married. I'm going to have kids. Like I've been investing in saving for my future. Like this is really in a way I had, it was all about down the road. Like I'm going to have a family one day and, and that's why I'm not going to, be frivolous with my money and I'm going to save it and I'm going to invest it. And I don't want, and part of that now I'm thinking about it. I, I, in a way, I think I was thinking, I don't want my kids to have to go through the challenges, struggles that I did growing up. And I was also like, I don't, I wanted to, I was also was very particular about even the relationships that I got into. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that came from my parents divorcing when I was three. Uh, all my memory was growing up in a, in a separated family and the struggles and the challenges with that and being with my mother, a single mother, um, a minority, she, she's Mexican, and uh, seeing the challenges that she faced every day as a minority as well as, as a woman mm-hmm. and her raising uh, my younger sister and I and, uh, you know, I became a little man in the house at a really young age. And so I was kind of an adult like many of us well before our years. Mm-hmm. And it, it was all the, all that kind of made me be like, I'm going to do this differently. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's no guarantees I'm going to be prepared. But, I'm gonna... Right. Well, I'm just going to not be, you know, make, I won't do my best to make sure that I choose a partner that, I'm going to stay in the relationship with Mm -hmm. that when I have children, they can have some of the things that I didn't have and they won't maybe the way I related to it at the time, you know, the embarrassment or the challenges or the, I just wanted, it was very important to me to create a different life Mm -hmm. for my family and children to be one day. And then the accident happened. And it was like I was there. I was like I was at the threshold. <laughs> I was literally ready to go pick out the ring. I was literally at the threshold of the rest of my life. Oh wow, the threshold of the yeah. rest of your life. Yeah. The very thing the culmination of everything to that point had been working towards. And then that morning I woke up, went to work and the rest of my life was changed. In a moment's notice. Mm-hmm. and In one stop. Literally. Yeah. And so then the challenge there became, I mean, I, there was a huge, the huge shift in my relationship, as you can imagine. I could imagine. Yeah. So, so, of course, that was shocking for you. And certainly it would have been shocking for your partner. Um, like, how was that like yeah it was incredible <clears throat> it's interesting because at the time i can remember being feeling so wronged in certain certain ways and wishing it was different mm-hmm. and i look back now and i go i was 29 years old and she was i think 25 years old <laughs> just, <laughs> just babies and so to some regard right yeah and uh, just finding our way and um but it, it was a challenge. I mean, many of the. So if you had been dating for three and a half years, that would have put her like at 22. Yeah. And you around 26. Right. Correct. Yep. Now she that's really about, is, baby. I was about, that was, yeah. That, <laughs> that was definitely, yeah. And so what was interesting is how I related to myself after mm-hmm. that accident. And how did you relate to yourself after the accident? Well, one, a lot, there was a lot of frustration around not being able to be the man that I wanted to be, the man that I had always been. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the struggles came from the judgments that I made against myself in comparison to who I was versus who I had become. And unless I could get back to that person, 
it was less than. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, this is a, and I've <laughs> done a lot of work, in some ways, it's still a thing that I see an opportunity in my life on a daily basis. And so they're like layers, right? But going back to that time in my life, <clears throat> it was very frustrating. I was used to being, okay, so I was a very athletic. I played tons of sports. I was out wakeboarding. I was out mountain biking and on top of, you know, basketball, flag football, you know, yeah. softball tournaments, you name it. I never watched TV unless it was to watch a game or to watch a movie. <laughs> I missed no Netflix. And no, chill? oh, there was no, there was no <laughs> Netflix. Didn't exist. <laughs> but yeah, there was shoot, there was none of that stuff. The I, other I, form was buy the DVD season collection and just keep putting in the disc. Well, that was what I ended up doing after I got hurt. Mm-hmm. T- before then, I literally I had never saw any episodes that were like Friends. I never saw. Uh, 90210, uh, Seinfeld, any of those. I had never seen one episode because there was no way I was going to be every Wednesday night on the couch at <laughs> 8 o'clock or whatever. I mean, that's just the way yeah. my life was always on the go mm-hmm. and always doing stuff and being active or being out. And um, so that was a massive shift for me to suddenly I could no longer be of value. Wow. No, quickly, friends stopped calling me. Um, not to be mean or that, you know, but it was like I was no longer, you need, no longer needed me on your basketball team or you no longer yeah, n- needed me as one of the other guys to be in the boat when we go wakeboarding or hmm. whatever it was. And, and, uh, and, and just on that, it's like when you describe friends stop calling. Did you find yourself having to reevaluate even like what you considered a friend to be? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I thought a lot about that at the time because it it wasn't anyone's fault. Mm -hmm. And ironically, when I became a cop, it was one of my things of like, I'm not going to leave my friends that I've always had because they'd hear – you know, there'd always be stories. I come from a uh, even my... if they had felonies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't have cared. Yeah, I, 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 I played on a softball team that probably had had the team were <laughs> the felons. felons. <laughs> but I was just how I was. I was always out there, you. like, That's hey, right, you know, yeah. I just say I love people, people, and like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm just out there, and we're having a good time and playing ball. I mean, I'm not gonna like condone me seeing something like that go on. But uh, as long as you don't do it in front of me, right? And I don't have any evidence. We're good. But you know what was interesting is, after I became a cop, it was more of other people who didn't wanted to stop being friends with me than me stop being friends with them, for whatever reasons. <laughs> yeah, know. who wants popo? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Might right. accidentally break the law. Right. What if you do a California yeah. stop? What do, do you pull out your uh, ticket pad and go? Uh, Hate to be the oh, one to do. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> that's silly. <laughs> but they, but in their mind, yeah, you, you don't know. know. Like it's mind. a cop. <laughs> but it was just a funny thing to yeah. have that. So really quickly, it's your friendships become mostly with the people you work with, and if you're in any profession or environment, it's like those that you can relate to. You often connect mm-hmm. with and spend time with. Exactly. And being in the type of profession that most don't understand, there was that draw to spend time with and be f- other friends with others. That yeah, that, that are in pro- the profession. Absolutely. You're on the kind of you got the same yeah. ideas, same responsibilities, you know. Yeah. And so quickly it was like they've got their lives going on and some are getting married, some are having kids, some and, and, and most of the time you spend your time at work and so a lot of your friendships were with the people you're Left working work. with. Yeah, let's go get something to eat at the shift, all of that. Right. So it's so at the same time it was understandable. It wasn't like somebody was being bad or should have did it differently. It was just the natural course. On the other side that's, you know, it was very lonely. Yeah. And that was also Part of me failing to like reach out and be like, hey, let's hang out. Like, let's connect. It was kind of like, again, me wanting to, some people to see 
what I wasn't saying. Yes. <laughs> if that makes mm-hmm. sense. It does. Yeah. It does. So it was a very lonely time, you said. And how did that impact your relationship? Like, <clears throat> Well, <laughs> it was difficult to be – it was difficult for me to be in that much pain. And I also didn't want, and at the same time, not wanting to tell the person I'm with that I am this weak, broken down person that can't or isn't capable of being all those things that I think that they expect of me. And even had been. And had been. Absolutely. Because if you're physically incapacitated uh, for lack of a better Mm -hmm. term I'm sure that affected all areas of your relationship absolutely absolutely I mean (laughs) going into (laughs) we went there (laughs) I guess I'll go there but even on a uh, a very personal side we're talking about sex yeah you know I was very fortunate to have an incredible stamina and be very good at what I did. <laughs> and <laughs> but when I was hurt You're like just for the record. <laughs> well well that's part understanding that is part of the understanding yeah, no, the challenge. No. Yeah, I know. And so what was confident, a, well, all of those well, things. Well what was a blessing now became a curse. Because having sex all night long was a blessing, but suddenly when I physically can't I'm in excruciating pain having sex for five, ten minutes, and then obviously not going to be capable of finishing in that short amount of time. And then your loved one is going to be feeling like, oh, am I not doing, you know, and then I'm feeling over responsible, like, oh, now I'm making my girlfriend who I love feel like she's not doing a good enough job to turn me on. And I mean, it's just a cycle of in every direction. Of just and when you're a, and you're a man and with those judgments and you're wanting to be the best boyfriend you can be in every aspect mm-hmm. and you can't be that, that pissed me off mm-hmm. like in a, such a deep, deep way. And, and that goes into a couple other simple examples. So, and, and it exposed like my righteousness of how I think a man should be, my belief systems around mm-hmm. how what a good man would be like. So some of these things that I, you know, thank my mother for, you know, really how to treat a woman wonderfully, always open their door, do this, that, you know, pump their gas for them, whatever it might be. These were all things that I instilled in me of like, that's what a good loving man is supposed to do. And I love my Agreed. mother. <laughs> so I love my mother dearly. And like I would, you know, and it was so like, absolutely, I'm going to be that kind of man. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you what. It made me so upset inside. Simple things like we'd pull up to get gas. And my girlfriend has to get out and pump her own gas while I'm sitting in the passenger seat. Mm-hmm. You know what? Probably nobody <laughs> noticed that. But to me, it was like, I'm a, you know, I look like a young guy. I'm in shape. Like I was all it was me judging me mm-hmm. really. You know? And I was like, Oh, look, all I could run through my mind is, Oh yeah. Look at that piece of shit dude making his girl pump her own gas. Like what a crappy boyfriend. And it just ate me up. And physically I just couldn't do that. Or we'd get groceries and we'd come home and she's got to carry all the bags of groceries in. Mm-hmm. Why well, just sit there like a piece of shit? Those are the type of things that you – no, know, I'm telling you, it's, it's weird that those are the things that suck. Like all the pain and suffering, like I'm telling you, I can't even express like – but that I felt like whatever, that's me that has to put up with that. Like I can, you know, put the world, the weight of the world on my shoulders in that way. Like – if it's just taking on more pain, I'll do it. But that was something that was like out of my control. Mm-hmm. And it was so frustrating. So what was your response? Did you start pushing her away? No. No, I don't I don't I don't think that at all happened. 
I mean, it may be interesting to explore that. But I remembered uh, there were just certain ways where we had been in alignment before that were exposed that suddenly we weren't as in alignment. I can remember, for example, one night just being in such excruciating pain sitting on the couch. And it was the point where I, to the point where I had to say something. <laughs> which if you haven't figured that out by now, that was a lot. And I said, Hey babe, can you do me a favor? Can you please just, just rub right here just for a minute. And I can't tell you like, just, just to ask that little favor, what that was for me inside. And I said that she said, ah, you know, I'm not really good at stuff like that. Mm. And I was just like, Oh, you got it. Are you freaking kidding me? Like all the massages I give you, all the things and all the like, like I don't, I'm like, I don't care. Can you just like, can you just put your hand on there? At that point, like I literally just wanted the touch of something. So, uh, you know, and I was like, didn't bitch or moan. So I wasn't expressing like my thoughts about it, but I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. And I had such judgment on her around that. And then the next day, I remember her coming home. We're back to my place. She basically had lived in my house at that time. And she walks in like, oh, it was a hard day at work. Oh, can you work? Can you massage me? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I massaged her. And anyway, so... But I just, you know, but that was just like, that was just her being, she didn't, wasn't doing anything wrong. You know, I mean, it's not how I would do it. But that, see, that was like, I understand now that was me projecting my judgments of what loving or how you should or what, whatever. And, and there were just aspects that now that I was in this place of need that were shining a light on more of how we, we weren't in alignment. And that hadn't been something she had been doing. I hadn't and had so, to. Yeah. For the first time in my life, I had gone into a relationship where there wasn't struggle and suffering around it. You know, I remember my whole life it was always like, hey, are you, we're going to like in it together. Like whatever the struggle, struggle or the challenge was financially or this or that. Or, and when I had met her, I had worked so hard to get things dialed into my life that we, you know. Kind of, we did what we wanted and when we wanted, took trips, like went out to dinner, went to this, went to that. And, <laughs> and, and we had a lot of fun and things were great. And I remember thinking in my mind, like, wow, I wonder, you know, if we were in a tough spot. What would it be like? Mm -hmm. You know that I mean? Cause that's when you, I think you really find out who you are. Yeah. This is how, when you show up, when you hit that adversity. Who you are and who you're with. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, well, an interesting, <clears throat> to continue that story, even regardless of that, I had still planned. I had had surgery on my neck. It didn't work, as I mentioned before. The broken neck never healed. The fusion never fused. <laughs> They wanted to go back in and do surgery and fuse more, even more levels. And I <clears throat> wasn't really feeling comfortable with that. And ironically, at the same time, so around that same time, I had been like, you know what? It's, it's, it's that time I feel like at, toward, at the end of the year, things are still going the way they're going. It's time to propose to her. So I looked at rings and this was even after the accident. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So this was after the accident that 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 it had happened, and it was after uh, the neck rub. Yeah, no yeah. I mean, rub. I don't remember if it was before <laughs> or after that, but you know, I mean, that, you know, we all have our moments, and it, she was a she was an awesome person. I'm not in any way trying to knock on her. Like I said, she was 25. I was 29. <laughs> like we were, we were young, you know, we're mm -hmm. still finding our way. And, and, um, it was more about how I was relating to it than anything. And 
So I remember thinking, looking in advance on the calendar and figuring out like what weekend could I propose to her and what could we do? And I had figured it out and I had figured out the date, August 4th was the day that I was going to propose to her. Now, let's go back. So shortly after that, I find out my mom needs to go into the hospital. And she lived in, um, she lived in Arizona in Chandler, just outside of Phoenix. And so she needed to go in to get her tricuspid valve repaired. Uh, like it was an elective surgery, uh, not life threatening or anything. Just is that in the heart? Yeah, it's in one of the hearts valves in the heart. And uh, she was dealing with a lot of um, fatigue and and um, feeling lethargic and weight gain and some different things. And and the doctor was like, yeah, well, it's because that valve's not working properly. So we go and we can just fix that up and you'll be good to go. <clears throat> so I fly in to be with my mom for the weekend. And she goes through that procedure, heart surgery, and comes out of it. And she ends up, while we're sitting sitting there with her in ICU and she coats, she turns totally blue right there in front, stops breathing, from and right in the middle of having a conversation. And they rush in and... Uh, they revive her and take her back in for surgery. And I'll, I'll try to make this story quick. It's, it's a long journey, but she ends up going through three heart surgeries within 16, 17 days. Hmm. And because each time they met and something got messed up. And they then it fixed blew one off, thing and, then, and it threw right. off something else. No, it was the same valve. Oh, it was the same valve that they were so fixing. So they repaired it. it, and then they said, oh, well, this time, well, we've got to replace it. So the second time, they replaced it. And then, she again, she's sitting there in ICU, and we're sitting there with her, and all of a sudden, she stops breathing and dies again. They revive her. And Ooh. this time, they go, well, we need to stitch it deeper. So then they stitched it deeper. But this time, she comes out, and they go, we caused a heart block. So now we've got to take her in for a fourth surgery on the 20th day to put in a pacemaker and then they did that and then so and then it, it's a long but they m- ended up messing up a lot of things along the way it ended up being a four month journey of being with her and then they said that she needed a, her heart replaced she needed a heart transplant and then there it was it was a lot of mistakes that they had made on their end that ultimately uh, I ended up having to pull the plug on her and take her life four mm. months into it. And the, wow. cra- the crazy thing in there was how I had related. Again, like with my girlfriend at the time, because I was about to open a dance studio with her, not the ballroom dance studio, oh, but wow. we okay. were taking over the ownership of a, a tap jazz and ballet studio for so, so dance has always yeah. been close to ah, you. you know. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Say I had a thing for dancers for a little while. <laughs> but I didn't even know she was a dancer when I met her. We were out dancing, <laughs> but I didn't know she, she was, was a, a dan- dancer. Yeah. A real dancer. She was one of the NBA uh, dancers. Okay. Yeah. And um, so <clears throat> we... We were taking over this dance studio. Well, at the time when that was going into place was towards the end of being with my mom. And I never came back. So I went through for the weekend, but I wasn't, I couldn't, I didn't want to leave. There's no way I can leave my mom when she's going through all this. And ironically, or I don't know if it's ironic, but I've got my own challenges going on with my physical health. I'm like in deep in the midst of my neck surgery not working, all the other back and joint problems and everything else I'm there and so that I'm not able to go to like my doctor's appointment and then the medical people are playing games with me they're like oh well we're not refilling your medications because you didn't come to your appointment I'm like I'm with my mother who's in the hospital dying I'm not leaving Arizona to come back to California to go to a doctor's appointment you guys already know I'm permanently disabled why you would play a game on me, like withholding medications that you know how much severe pain that I'm in as some sort of passive aggressive game to get me to come into an appointment. So I guess you can get your appointment fee. Yeah. I mean, anyway, it was, it was crazy. The, the arguments and the challenges on the side of what I was dealing with that I was needing to go through. And then with 
to have to, like your doctors, like almost to beg them to like, please don't. I'm already out here dealing with all of this and you know what I'm physically dealing with. Don't leave me out here with nothing. (laughs) Like if I could come back, I would, but I can't. I'm legally responsible. My mother's in the critical. She's what the? I mean, what kind like, of common sense, on. man? Thought you were supposed to do no harm. Like <laughs> I was like, I, I can't even explain to you the the the. I was it was anger and bewilderment. Probably a lot of all those things. And and my girlfriend was missing me a lot, and she was hey. Cal, can't you when, you, when are you going to come back home? Like, I miss you. We got, you know, we got this going on. I'm like, babe, I'm sorry. Like, I'm with with my mom, you know, and I can't, I'm not going to leave her. Like, and I flew her to come see me a couple of times. And it's great. She loved me. She wanted to be with me. Uh, but in my mind, I kept running through like, man, like, if you were in this spot, I would do all my best to make you feel like I'm fine without you. <laughs> yeah. Just so that you don't have any extra pressure on you. But that was more of my projections of how you should or shouldn't be. And so it was driving me nuts. Again, it kept, I dealt with a lot in my life of this feeling misunderstood. And why Mm -hmm. can't people just get, why can't the doctor just get like, dude, I'm with my mom in the hospital. She's dying. Do you think I'm lying to you, playing a game with you? I don't Mm -hmm. understand why here I am, somebody who put my life on the line to protect society. And you're going to play games with me like I'm some Con man trying to get the something drug over on you, just trying to get a, get a next fix or something, I, right? And so that just added on to all my own judgments of like, man, oh, I hate that I even have to be on this medication. And on top of it, you and then I'm like, literally, I'm about to. I feel like my body is going to explode constantly from the amount of pressure and pain, and and then at the same time having your heart be cracking open oh, because of your mom. Yeah, mom's like. Yeah, I can't even. (laughs) That was really, really hard. Harder than that was the hardest thing I'd ever gone through, regardless of because that was something, again, was out of my control. Like, make me go through it. God, give this to me. Let me take on the burden so that she doesn't have to go through this. Mm. And, um, And then... The idea or the knowledge that the doctors had made mistakes that uh-huh. causes, and we got to go back in. We got to go back in. At one point, after her fourth surgery, and I had been tracking everything, right, trying to keep on, keep on. I was sleeping in the hospital. In my physical condition, I wasn't even leaving. I was spending the night there, all <laughs> in the window seal, <laughs> trying to. I'm just a mess, man. But it was like okay. Got to be there. My mom, I'm telling you, she, she was an amazing, beautiful soul that there's no way in the hell she would ever leave my side. So there's no way I'm leaving hers. And um, she comes out of that fourth surgery, and it was like five, seven days into it. I'm like, where's her thyroid medication? And they're like, thyroid medication? What are you talking about? I'm like, the thyroid medication she needs in order to live because she had thyroid cancer when she was a kid and they removed her thyroid. Mm. And I'm like, she'd just been through four surgeries, three open heart surgeries in 20 days to struggle to go overcome that to begin with. And then on top of it, you're going to stop giving her her medication that she needs in order to live to start with. And that's not the type of thing you could just take a shot and your levels are back to normal. Like it takes several days to like build that back up. And uh, so anyway, and then then <laughs> and they said that she had um, she went into renal failure and pneumonia, and, it, it, and the journey goes on and on. The reason why we can go into that another day, but the reason why I brought it up was around the challenge with my girlfriend. And so that was a big struggle. With on the side, that relationship I was having. And and then there was a point where she had been life lighted to U of A to get the new heart. She had overcome all those things and got the U of A. And then they, by the time I drove down there and got in there, a resident doctor had screwed up and put her back on medications that she wasn't supposed to be on. And they ended up having to put her into a self-induced coma when she was back into renal failure. So by the time I got there, I never got to uh, even see her or talk to her. 
again. And so was she talking when she oh, left the other house? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay, like she was, she was doing great. And she then was, it was like, hey, we got this heart. We're about to light flight you over there. Right. She had to overcome. I mean, they won't give her a heart unless she's healthy. So she had to overcome the pneumonia, the the uh, renal failure, the um. The several things that were going on. Her white blood cell count had gotten to like 17,000 that is similar to someone with severe leukemia. Mm. And uh, they had done an exploratory surgery and said, oh, yeah, yeah. They thought there was an infection or something. But they went in there and came out and said, no, the problem is she needs a new heart. She's got a bad heart and she needs a new heart. After all Nothing that. Nothing else is wrong. Mm-hmm. But she now she's got to come overcome these other things in order to be healthy enough to go get, get the it. heart. She can go to UCLA or she can go to U of A. And we ended up choosing U of A. She overcame those things. And I could remember, now you're reminding me of, remember when she was healthy enough to start coming to, conscious and aware, and I could have a conversation with her. And they left her intubated because she was coding so many times when she was fine. They wanted to be ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there was one time where she was, they said, oh, she can go home. Oh, wow. On Mother's Day. Mm. So it was like Mother's Day, mom's coming home. The night before I went home to make sure I got her place ready for her. So she came home, she'd be in a clean place, everything. Uh, Came in that morning to pick her up. Happy Mother's Day. She couldn't even speak English. She went to talk and it was literally like something that scrambled up the words not even like a foreign language, like literally. was not Spanish. Like or... alien. No, I mean, she could speak Spanish. She, obviously, she's Mexican. But uh, no, it was like a, <laughs> some alien, like where the brain gets so messed up that it literally is scrambling the letters or something. Wow. It was really weird. And I was like, told the nurse, what? get in here. What the hell's going on? And they're like, what? Oh, and they rush her down ICU and. Uh, I'll have to have a meeting with the doctor, figure out like what do you guys know what the hell you're doing, what's going on here. But back to she's at U of A, she's in the self induced coma. I'd been with her for about a month there, I think. And it's coming to the weekend of our grand opening for the for the dance studio. And and my girlfriend's like, Can't you please just come home? For the grand opening. Can you just be here? And I was like, um, you know what? Let me check in with the doctors and see if I can just leave for the day, fly back. Check with the doctors. I know she's in the state, but do you feel like she's in a healthy enough state that I can leave her? I'm going to fly out in the morning and I'm going to fly back out at night and fly back at night. I just want to know that she's not going to pass or something while while I'm gone. And they go, yeah, I feel like she's stable enough that you can do that. So I so I get in the plane. I fly back to Sacramento. I get off the plane. I turn my phone on. And I've got a message. Hey, your mom woke up from her coma. And all I could think was, she was alone. Like I'd been there by her side all day, every day. And the moment I leave, she wakes up and she's alone. And I I turn around, I, I didn't go to the grand opening. I got on the next freaking flight flying back to Phoenix and I rushed back to the hospital and I came in there I'm sorry but she went back into her coma and that was my last opportunity to ever talk to her and I and the last words that I had ever said to her were right before um, they life lighted her, and I was she was she had come to, and I was like, "Hey, mom, they cut you, found you a heart. We're gonna do a heart transplant. Everything's gonna be great." 
And she was like, she couldn't talk because she was intubated, but she was like, no, no. I mean, she was just had terror in her eyes. Like, no, you, we can't do this. And I had such fear that came into me. Like, what? Oh my God, mom, you're going to die. Everything that I'm being told, you're going to die if you don't get this heart. Like, I was so angry with her. I was so pissed that you're going to, you're going to let yourself die. I mean, and I, <laughs> keep in mind, I'm going through all my, my own pain and the medications and mm-hmm. what I'm just like, I'm, I'm upset. I'm like, mom, mom, what are you doing? Are you stupid? Like, you're going to die. Like, you need this heart. And uh, she and she knew something, man. She knew something. I don't I don't know what she saw or what she knew. And then she agreed. She agreed to go there. And like I said, when she arrived, the doctors, the resident doctor on duty, switched the medications back, messed her up. They ended up going in and doing an exploratory surgery there, and found out that her heart actually wasn't bad. There was nothing wrong with her heart. The problem was they put an infected valve in her. The other hospital put an infected valve in her. But by now it had infected all of her other organs. Mm. And they said, I don't know if she can live. I mean, they literally, when they went in for the exploratory surgery, they said, hey, she's probably going to die from the surgery, but she will be dead in the next 24 hours if we don't do it and find out what's going on. And I had to agree to like, okay, do it even though she's probably going to die because there's a chance she could live on the other end of it. So they came out of that and they're like, we can get rid of this infection. If we can get rid of this infection, we'll put a new valve in her and she'll go home living to be old, old lady, dying old lady. But the problem is, can we get rid of all this infection? And um, so we ended up taking numerous steps <clears throat> to fight we took numerous steps to try to overcome those infections. And uh, and it got to a final stage of where they just cracked her chest open and packed it with antibiotics like gauze and like they would do in the old, I guess in the old days on the battlefields. They just <laughs> soaked the gauze and antibiotics and just pack it directly onto the organs. <clears throat> wow. And then they, at that point, they had come in and said, it's not working. The infection is so bad, it's covering all of her organs. It's just, you know, it's time, man. And uh, at this point, they had screwed up so many times. I was like, I can't believe it. I can't believe, just because you're telling me it, I can't believe it. Mm-hmm. If what you're saying is true, show me. <laughs> they were like, you want to see the insides of your mother? I'm like, yeah. If you're telling me it's thoroughly infected all over all of her organs. Yeah. At this point, I'm not taking anybody for their word. I need to see it. And so they suited me up, and they brought me in there, and they unpacked <laughs> the gauze, and I looked at inside at all of her organs and saw all the pus and all the, what I imagined was the infection, it looked disgusting. It was all over, everywhere. I thought about it later. I don't know what it was supposed to look like. <laughs> I'm like, shit, I guess I should have figured that out first, huh? But it was Ooh. it was disgusting, man. Mm, mm, mm. And they had told me that she won't she will not the only way the only thing keeping her alive is all these machines or whatever. We turn off, she's gonna pass like that. Like it's a seamless pass. And, like almost uh, instantaneous. Like some people, they live on for hours, yeah. and even some people days after they right. took. But they were like, "It's going to be in." Yeah, I mean, they were. They had been. There had been a nurse. That's another long story. But she had was battling me. She went behind my back, telling family members that it was wrong for us to be keeping her alive, and that she was in so much pain, and and became like this, this um, 
antagonist to um, be against my mom living. And so there was, I had ended up having to go to a big peer meeting with all the heads of the hospital to fight for my mother's life and, um, <clears throat> and try to overcome this woman's uh, mm-hmm. will to, to take her, to try to take my mom's life. And <clears throat> the agreement that they had coming out of that meeting was to do these last final steps. And the thing that was, most challenging was being coerced in a sense to pull the plug Mm -hmm. and then finally making that decision to do to to do so my sister and my niece little she was very young at the time larissa flew into town and my my stepdad norm was there and we all were. I was at my mom's bedside on at, on her left hand there, and they were at the end of the bed, and then the nurse was on the other end to turn the machines off. And I remember my niece climbed up on the bed. She could barely talk. So it might have been two, three, three, I guess. And she started swinging, singing. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> how I wonder how you are. And um, and we turned off the machines. I'm holding my mom's hand. And I t- she opened her eyes. She woke up. And she was just looking into my eyes. And she was struggling to breathe. You could hear her. <gasps> And she was squeezing my hand and looking in my eyes, and tears were coming out. And and I, to me, it was she was like saying, "Why aren't you helping me? Why aren't you not? Why are you just standing there watching me die? Like do something to help me?" And I kept thinking in my mind, she's gonna pass, and he, she's like, "This is the last gasp for air." And it just continued, and she struggled, and she struggled, and she started to suck. I literally watched for well over 15 minutes, which felt like an hour. My mother suffocated to death while she looked me in the eyes, pleading for help. And at no point did I do anything to help her. And that was the most painful, excruciating thing I had ever gone through in my life. And that was one of the biggest struggles and challenges I had with forgiving myself, forgiving into the pressure around that. And the the irony in that story, why I went into it, was my mother ended up passing on August 4th. Hmm. The day you were going to propose. That's right. And there was that was the other thing I couldn't forgive myself for was leaving. I wasn't mad at my girlfriend. Hey, I was really hard on myself for giving into the pressure, giving into the pressure in that situation and not being there when she opened her eyes. And within the end, me the very last words I said to her was yelling at her <laughs> for not wanting the heart transplant, and then, in the end, having her stare me in the eyes. What I felt at the time, I don't know that I would relate to it that way now, but at the time, you know, it was just all these reflections of like, oh, you're not good enough. You're not doing it. You work hard, but you come up short every time. Mm-hmm. And, and, and when do I follow my inner truth? And that's been the biggest guidance for me moving forward is like, how do I stand in my truth whether anybody else understands me or not? Mm-hmm. How do I trust self? How do I trust God? Trust the universe, source, however you relate to it? And how do I stand in my truth? It doesn't mean that the outcome has to be the outcome I want. Exactly. But to stay in my truth. And each and every one of those circumstances, I didn't. And that's the thing that I'm most challenged with. Is it that you didn't? Or that you perceive yourself as not. I mean, 
I mean, just, well, there's an opportunity for some grace. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just saying, yeah, it's like in your saying. truth, what, to me, what I heard, and I just want to thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing such a, a, a heart-wrenching story. That's just, you know, my mother's still living. She's 83, and, mm. and, and I just can't even imagine, like, you know, mom, you know what I mean? Mm. And um, what I heard you, though, saying, like, in the instance with your girlfriend was you were, the truth is, it's like, you know, I love you. You know, I love my mom, committed to my mom. I love you. I'm committed to you and trying to figure out that way. And it was just, like, on that day, you know what I'm saying? Like, irony had its hand at work. And and then your truth was hop right back on the plane and go back, even though you were already there, yeah. even though it was already done. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it sounds like because that sounds like a self, sounds like a self judgment. You know that it didn't honor my truth. Oh, there de- <laughs> there definitely was a lot of. I can't. I mean, it's a lot of different emotions oh, yeah, going yeah. through this whole thing. I mean, because then it's like because me, I would wonder like after that like. How did you even look at your girlfriend after yeah. that? Like, you know, it's like I listened to you, you know, I left my yeah. mom's side. Yeah, no, I know that would definitely mean she knew. She was like, I knew in that moment it was over. But it gratefully I didn't I did not I'm being dead honest when I say that. Like I did not blame that on her because I and this is pro- more of my challenge of not wanting to be a victim grow- growing up is I think I took way too much of the responsibility for everything that ever happened by not wanting to be a victim. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah. It's almost like, it was like I decide there was no grace or, you know, the grace in the way that I might handle something or any kind of leeway for mistake or for just being human. Because yeah, I was just so hard on. I was like, you should have known better. Uh. <laughs> but in a very silent way, this wasn't anything that I said to anybody, or I never went for help. I never talked to a therapist. Never talked to a coach. I never, you know, I, I never talked to a family member. It was a very when, internal. When I mean, all these, all, all this. You mean then why you were me, going through all that? these years of. Pain and and, and with you know, my we mother. To, you know, we both went to the University of Santa Monica. I, I hear you. Who you talked to was yourself. Yeah. Say that again. Say that in a different way for me. <laughs> no, I said, you know, we both went to the University yeah. of Santa Monica. That was many, then, many years later for me. Uh, yeah, that's what uh, I'm saying. Oh, that's what I was asking no, you when, yeah. when you say you never, you meant while you oh, were going Oh, what I'm saying is d- through the journeys, through those struggles, through the journeys. It was on the other end it of was, it. Where, yeah. Right, because of the ego aspect you know, when we talk about ego, we don't mean like egotistical. We mean the part that judges right, wrong, good, bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I mean, if there's anything that I can share for, for others is hopefully in sharing my challenges and my story is not to gain sympathy But relatability to gain, like, maybe there's someone else out there. I wish someone, I wish I had to ask for help or I wish there was podcast didn't exist. You know, I wish there was internet. I don't don't think really even existed, not like it does now. Who knows if I was even in that mindset to seek it out because I probably wasn't, to be honest with you. And so that was my opportunity through these challenges to to expand and to grow and to not perceive it as a weakness and to recognize that asking for help is a strength, it takes more courage and fortitude to ask for help. And to try to carry it by yourself, I mean. Hell yeah. I mean, and this, this segment has been just so rich and we still are just working at the tip. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy Mac 3.0. <laughs> no, no, so, no, no, yeah, I mean, so again, I'll ask you, no. like I asked you the first time, if you'd yeah. be willing to, you know, at some point, like, continue this conversation. And, you know, still we didn't, you know, we just relationships and yeah. things on how you processed and moved your way through the challenges. Yeah, this is very much feels like another that's, layer. That's great. You're a great point because I did not get a chance to talk about what steps did I take 
to shift into the other side to get where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. And, and I think this is a great opportunity. Like we're sharing our stories. We're sharing our struggles as a way to open the door to have others. We really want other guests to come on and other people to share their struggles and their challenges and their strength, their, yes, their tools that they use to, um, claim more of the life that they want for themselves. Absolutely. Because that's really what we want. It's a community here. At Conversations with Friends, it's friends. a community. How, <laughs> How many, many of, of us, us have, have them? them? Friends. <laughs> a lot of us do. If you're here, we're together, baby. So we're here to create shine a light and love, to open that space for others to relate, to not feel misunderstood, to to have that connection we want, we want to share that. We're not we don't want to be someone we're trying to fix things or we're trying to change you because really you're amazing. You're amazing and we're stronger together. We are. And we just want to shine a light to help discover our authentic selves, not the conditioned self. Like I explained today with a lot of my Danny's conditioned self of the way he should or shouldn't be in life. And so I mean, wait, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Um, I think we should continue this conversation. We will continue this conversation. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank we you. love you guys. We love you. See you Peace on the next and episode. Love. Oh, wait. Love. <laughs> love, baby. Love. love. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what you do? Which one? Which Can't one? Catch. That's what friends are oh, for. Oh, Good you don't want to hear this. Times. Say, In bad, <laughs> bad times. times. I'll be on your side forevermore. Hey, my mom loved that song. What a perfect thing. Awesome. That's what friends are for. Woo! Love you guys. Love you. See you next time. Peace and love. Peace and love.